The dawn of the first day of preparation for Operation Manhood brought with it a palpable sense of anticipation. The final part of the battle loomed ahead, promising to be a decisive confrontation that could shift the tide in our favour. The division, under the temporary command of Brigadier Fisher, was a hive of activity, with every unit fine-tuning its role in the upcoming operation. Sergeant O'Malley led a detailed briefing early in the morning, outlining the strategic importance of Operation Manhood and the expected contributions of our armoured division. The integration of our efforts with the infantry units from Australia, Britain and South Africa was emphasised as crucial to the operation's success. Private Davies, whose spirits had been buoyed by the camaraderie and shared determination of the division, took it upon himself to ensure that all the equipment in our section was in optimal condition. His meticulous attention to detail during the vehicle and weapon checks was a testament to his commitment to our collective success. Corporal Jenkins, recognising the significance of seamless communication during the operation, conducted several drills with the communication teams. These drills were designed to simulate various scenarios, ensuring that we could maintain effective communication under different conditions. Throughout the day, we engaged in joint exercises with the infantry units. These exercises allowed us to refine our coordination and familiarise ourselves with each other's tactics and capabilities. The mutual respect and understanding that developed during these sessions were invaluable, fostering a sense of unity and shared purpose. As the sun began to set, the division gathered for a final debriefing. Brigadier Fisher, addressing the troops, spoke of the honour and responsibility that came with our role in Operation Manhood. His words, marked by a deep understanding of the challenges ahead, inspired confidence and resolve among the ranks. The evening was spent in quiet reflection and preparation. Each member of the division understood the gravity of the task ahead, and the crucial role we would play in the outcome of the battle. The camaraderie that had sustained us through the trials of the North African campaign was now our anchor, as we stood on the brink of a pivotal moment in history. The operation, set to commence on the 26th, had been meticulously planned, and the final preparations were now in full swing. Our role in the grand scheme was clear. Execute a night march to position ourselves strategically by daybreak ready to counter the anticipated Axis assault following the infantry's initial attack under the cover of darkness. Sergeant O'Malley's briefing at dawn underscored the critical nature of our task. Precision and stealth are key, he stressed, ensuring every member of our crew understood the significance of maintaining silence and discipline during the night march. The success of our mission hinged not just on reaching our designated positions undetected, but also on our readiness to engage the enemy at first light. Private Davies' meticulous attention to our tanks was more crucial than ever, ensuring that our machines were not only battle-ready, but also equipped for a silent approach through the desert night, was a task he undertook with a solemn dedication. Noise discipline extends to our gear, he reminded us, as he worked on minimising any sounds that could betray our approach. Corporal Jenkins's coordination efforts took on a new dimension, focusing on the synchronisation of our movements with the broader battle plan. The seamless execution of the night march, synchronised with the infantry's advance, was paramount. Jenkins conducted thorough checks of our communication equipment, ensuring that we could maintain contact with command and other units without compromising our stealth. The mock drills of the day transformed into night exercises, adapting our tactics to the unique challenges of nocturnal navigation and combat. These drills were not just about rehearsing movements, they were about adapting our senses and instincts to the desert's night environment, ensuring that we could operate as effectively in darkness as we did in daylight. The final briefing by Brigadier Fisher was not just a recapitulation of our objectives, but a reminder of the strategic importance of our mission. Your actions in the pre-dawn hours will set the stage for the entire operation, he articulated with a gravitas that left no room for doubt. Your discipline and courage will pave the way for our infantry to hold the ground they capture. As night enveloped the camp, the sense of anticipation was almost tangible. The operation's success depended as much on the execution of our night march 
as on the bravery and precision of the infantry's attack. This was a moment that would test our resolve, our training, and our unity as never before. I spent the night reviewing the route, the contingencies, and the signals. The faces of my crew, etched with determination and trust, were a constant reminder of the responsibility resting on our shoulders. The promise I made to myself and to my men was simple yet profound. To navigate the silence of the desert night with unwavering resolve. To emerge at daybreak not just as a force poised for battle, but as the embodiment of the hope and determination of the Allied cause. The final day before Operation Manhood was one of quiet intensity. The entire division was engaged in the last-minute preparations, with each man and machine fine-tuning their readiness for the night march that lay ahead. Sergeant O'Malley convened a series of final checks on our tanks, paying close attention to the stealth modifications we had implemented. The importance of a silent approach could not be overstated, and O'Malley's meticulous nature ensured that nothing was left to chance. Remember, lads, silence tonight is our greatest ally, he reminded us, his voice carrying the weight of the impending mission. Private Davies, whose dedication to our tank, Bessie, had become a source of pride for the entire crew, was double-checking every potential source of noise. His efforts to secure loose equipment and tools were thorough, leaving no stone unturned in his quest to minimise our acoustic signature. Corporal Jenkins, meanwhile, was coordinating with the signals unit to establish a set of communication protocols for the night. The challenge of maintaining radio silence while ensuring we could still communicate effectively was significant, but Jenkins approached the task with a calm efficiency that was reassuring. As dusk approached, the division gathered for one last briefing. Brigadier Fisher outlined the strategic importance of our role in the operation once more, emphasising the need for discipline and silence during the march. The success of tomorrow's operation begins with tonight's march, he stated firmly. Your actions will determine the battlefield's balance come dawn. The tension of the upcoming night march was palpable as darkness fell over the camp. Each crew member spent the remaining hours in their own way, some in quiet contemplation, others in whispered conversations with comrades. Despite the varied activities, a shared sense of purpose united us all. I spent the evening walking among the tanks and men, offering words of encouragement and sharing in the collective resolve that permeated the air. The trust and camaraderie that had been built over countless days of preparation were our most significant assets. We march together as one, I reminded my crew. Each of us plays a part in the success of this operation. As midnight approached, the division readied itself for the march. The engines of our tanks hummed to life, a sound muffled by the desert night. In the darkness we moved out, a ghostly caravan winding its way through the sand. The only evidence of our passage was the soft crunch of treads on the desert floor, quickly swallowed by the vast silence surrounding us. The march was a testament to our discipline and training. Despite the darkness, we navigated the desert terrain with precision, guided by the stars and the faint outlines of the landscape. The hours passed in a tense silence, each man focused on the task at hand, aware of the critical nature of our mission. As the first light of dawn began to touch the horizon, we reached our designated positions. The operation was about to begin, and we were ready. Our night march, executed with stealth and precision, had positioned us perfectly to support the infantry's assault. The quiet of the desert was about to be shattered by the sounds of battle, but we were prepared. We had done everything in our power to ensure the success of Operation Manhood. Now, as day broke over El Alamein, we stood ready to fulfil our role in the coming engagement, united by a single purpose and an unbreakable bond of brotherhood. The eve of Operation Manhood found us in a state of heightened anticipation, our actions guided by the meticulous plans laid out for the night march. The day had been a blur of activity, each of us absorbed in the final preparations, acutely aware of the importance of the task at hand. As I walked through the ranks of our armoured regiment, the air was thick with a blend of determination and underlying tension. The men were busy with last-minute checks on their vehicles, ensuring that every tank was in optimal condition for the journey ahead. 
The clank of tools and subdued commands filled the air, a testament to the urgency and focus that had taken hold of us all. Sergeant O'Malley was a force of calm efficiency, his voice steady as he oversaw the loading of supplies. His occasional joke did more than lighten the mood. It reminded us of the camaraderie that had carried us this far. Yet beneath his composed exterior, I could sense the same nervous energy that gripped us all, a shared understanding of the challenges that lay ahead. Private Davies was hunched over a map with Corporal Jenkins, their heads close together as they discussed the route we would take. The importance of stealth and precision was paramount. Any deviation could compromise our position or delay our arrival. The seriousness with which they undertook their task spoke volumes of their commitment and the collective anxiety about the night's operation. In the midst of the preparations, I found myself grappling with the weight of leadership. Each decision, each order carried with it the lives of my men and the success of the mission. The responsibility felt immense, a constant companion amid the whirlwind of activity. Yet there was no room for doubt. My focus remained on ensuring that every detail was addressed, that every contingency was planned for. As the sun began to dip below the horizon, casting long shadows across the desert, the atmosphere among the crew shifted. The banter and activity of earlier hours gave way to a more introspective mood. Men checked their personal equipment, wrote letters home, or simply sat in quiet contemplation. The reality of what was to come hung heavily in the air. The night march was a critical element of Operation Manhood, our movements cloaked in darkness to secure a strategic advantage at dawn. The success of the operation hinged not just on our martial prowess, but on our ability to move as one, undetected and precise. In those final hours before departure, as darkness enveloped the desert, a palpable sense of unity emerged. Despite the underlying anxiety, there was an unspoken confidence in our abilities, a belief in our training and in each other. We were more than a unit, we were a family, bound by a common purpose and a shared resolve to face whatever the night might bring. As I looked out over the assembled ranks, the last light of day fading into night, I felt a profound sense of pride. These men, my men, were ready. Together, we would navigate the challenges of the night march, a silent testament to the strength and spirit of the 1st Armoured Division. The night had fully taken hold by the time we set out, the darkness a cloak that both shielded and heightened our senses. The engines of our Crusader tanks rumbled to life, a low, powerful drone that seemed to resonate with the tension that filled the air. In formation, we moved out, the desert night engulfing us as we ventured into the unknown, guided only by the faint glimmers of stars overhead. The silence of the desert night was deceptive, broken only by the roar of our engines and the occasional crackle of the radio, each transmission a lifeline in the vast, uncharted darkness. The voice of Lieutenant Thompson, our navigator, came through the speakers, calm and steady, directing our path with precision. His updates were a constant reminder of the precarious nature of our mission, every word carefully weighed and delivered. As we advanced, the visibility was near to none, save for the soft glow of luminescent paint that marked the rear of the tank in front. This faint guide was all that stood between cohesion and chaos, a thin thread that we dared not break. The sensation of moving through such obscurity was disorienting, each tank an island of steel and determination, rolling through the sand in tight formation. The tension within my own tank was palpable, a living entity that sat with us in the cramped confines of our metal beast, Bessie. Sergeant O'Malley, manning the radio, relayed updates with a focus that belied the strain we all felt. His fingers danced over the dials, ensuring our communication lines remained open and clear, a critical lifeline to the rest of our division. Private Davies, beside him, kept his eyes fixed on the instruments, monitoring our speed and direction with an intensity that spoke volumes. His usual joviality was replaced by a concentrated seriousness, understanding the importance of maintaining our place within the formation. Corporal Jenkins, our gunner, sat in silent vigilance, his hand ever ready at the controls. Though the likelihood of engagement was low, the threat of a surprise encounter with enemy patrols loomed large in our minds. 
a ghostly possibility in the dark expanse of the desert. As the hours wore on, the strain of navigating through such conditions took its toll. The constant vibration of the tank, the unending darkness and the high stakes of our mission merged into a singular challenge of endurance and focus. Yet, through it all, there was an unspoken bond that held us together, a shared resolve that pushed us onward. The updates from Lieutenant Thompson continued, each one a reminder of the progress we made and the distance yet to cover. With each transmission, the tension ebbed and flowed, a tide governed by the uncertainties of the night and the unyielding determination of our crew. The night march was a testament to the skill and spirit of the 1st Armoured Division, a silent march through the desert that spoke volumes of our commitment and courage. As dawn approached, bringing with it the promise of a new day and the impending challenge of Operation Manhood, I couldn't help but feel a surge of pride in my men and our machines, united in purpose and resolve under the cover of night. Dawn broke with a clarity that belied the turmoil of the night before. The first light revealed a landscape fraught with danger and disappointment. The operation, meticulously planned and executed with the utmost precision, stumbled at a critical juncture. The South Africans' task of clearing a path through the minefields to the southeast of the Miteria Ridge had fallen short of success. Reports filtering in painted a grim picture. The minefields remained, a deadly barrier not torn asunder by dawn's light as we had hoped. Our tanks, primed for action and support, found themselves hamstrung by this oversight. The infantry, our brothers in arms, left exposed on the unforgiving sands. The weight of this news settled heavily upon us, a tangible shift in the air as the realisation dawned that one Australian battalion and one British brigade bore the brunt of this misstep. Their losses, heavy and unyielding, were a stark reminder of the high stakes we played for in this grand, desolate theatre of war. My heart ached for them, for the lives altered and ended in those lost moments, a sentiment shared in the silent looks exchanged among my crew. By mid-morning, a semblance of momentum began to build as tanks started to weave their way through the gaps that had been opened in the minefield. Yet, this flicker of progress was swiftly challenged. The Germans, ever cunning and adaptable, had relocated their anti-tank guns, setting a deadly trap that halted our division's efforts. The crack of gunfire became a grim soundtrack to our struggle, each shot a stark reminder of the enemy's resilience and strategic foresight. Inside my tank, the atmosphere was tense, a palpable mix of frustration and determination. Corporal Jenkins, eyes narrowed, watched the horizon with a predator's focus, ready to respond to any threat that emerged from the haze. Sergeant O'Malley's hands moved with practised ease, ensuring our communications remained uninterrupted, a vital link in the chain that bound our division together. Private Davies' work was relentless, monitoring our position and ensuring our navigation was precise, a crucial task amidst the chaos. We moved with caution, threading our way through the perilous landscape, a testament to the skill and bravery of our crew and those around us. As we manoeuvred, the reality of our situation was ever-present. Each movement, each decision, was a dance with fate, a delicate balance between aggression and preservation. The echo of gunfire, the distant thud of explosions, and the sharp commands over the radio painted a vivid picture of the battle that unfolded, a battle that tested the limits of our resolve and capabilities. The day's challenges, while daunting, served to reinforce the bond that held us together. In the face of adversity, we found strength in our unity, a shared resolve to overcome and press forward. The battle for El Alamein was far from over, and though the morning brought setbacks, our spirit remained unbroken. We were the first armoured division, a force shaped by the trials of war, ready to face whatever lay ahead with courage and determination. In the aftermath of Operation Manhood, the mood within the division was sombre, reflective. The critique from Brigadier Frederick Kish, the chief engineer of the 8th Army, was a stark reminder of the operation's shortcomings. His condemnation of our hesitance to advance through the minefields, despite the creation of gaps, hit hard. Gaps had been created, he stated firmly. But the division would not move until they were completely satisfied their tanks would not strike mines. 
This criticism was not without its context. Our division had suffered significantly from mine-related casualties in previous actions. The conservation of our tanks was not just a strategic consideration, but a survival imperative. Yet, the revelation that some of the gaps during manhood were indeed clear, or at least not as perilous as feared, underscored a painful missed opportunity. The lack of coordination and communication between the units tasked with clearing the mines and our armoured brigades had resulted in a disjointed effort, leaving us blind to potential advances. The division's reluctance, grounded in the stark reality of our previous losses, was a decision born out of caution, but marked by a lack of real-time information. It was a moment that highlighted the critical importance of integrated operations and the dire consequences of siloed actions on the battlefield. In the days that followed, reflection turned to resolution. The long-term outcome of Brigadier Kish's critique was transformative. Each formation within the division was to be given integrated engineer support, a move that promised to bridge the gap between the sappers clearing the mines and the armoured units pressing forward. This structural change was aimed at empowering each formation to take responsibility for lifting mines in their path, a crucial adaptation designed to prevent the repetition of our recent operational hesitance. The introduction of integrated engineer support was more than just a tactical adjustment. It was a strategic evolution. It promised a future where our armoured advances would no longer be stymied by the unseen threat of mines, where our movements could be more fluid, more confident. This shift was a recognition of the need for closer coordination, for a seamless blend of engineering prowess and armoured might. As I contemplated these changes, I couldn't help but feel a mixture of emotions. The loss and the missed opportunities of Operation Manhood were a heavy burden, yet the lessons learned were invaluable. They spoke of the need for adaptability, for integrated operations that could match the complexities of modern warfare. The crew, too, felt the weight of these reflections. Sergeant O'Malley, always a source of strength, saw the changes as a positive step forward a way to ensure our bravery and sacrifice would not be undermined by logistical oversights. Private Davies, whose resolve had only strengthened, viewed the integration of engineer support as a means to mitigate the dangers we faced daily. Corporal Jenkins, for his part, recognised the potential for improved communication, for a future where information flowed freely, allowing us to make informed decisions in the heat of battle. Operation Manhood, with all its trials and tribulations, had been a turning point. It was a stark reminder of the challenges we faced, but also a beacon for the future, guiding us towards a more cohesive, more effective approach to warfare. As we looked ahead, the lessons of the past were our guide, the promise of integrated support, our hope for a more decisive, more successful engagement in the battles to come. As July drew to a close, the toll of the prolonged engagement at El Alamein was evident in the weary faces and battered equipment of the Eighth Army. The continuous cycle of offensive operations had pushed both men and machines to their limits, leaving us in a state of palpable exhaustion. The landscape around us, scarred by the relentless exchange of fire and the trappings of war, served as a stark testament to the challenges we had faced. The order from General Auschinleck to cease offensive operations came as a sombre acknowledgement of our current state. The directive was clear. Prioritise the strengthening of our defences in anticipation of a major counter-offensive. This shift in strategy marked a significant moment in the campaign, a pause in the push forward, allowing us the opportunity to regroup and fortify our positions. Sergeant O'Malley, upon receiving the news, set about organising the crew with a renewed focus on defence. We've held them off before, we'll do it again, he declared, his voice carrying the unspoken resolve that had become our hallmark. The task ahead involved not just physical reinforcement of our positions, but also a mental recalibration, preparing ourselves for the defensive stance we were now tasked with. Private Davies, whose efforts had never waned, took to the new directive with a quiet determination. The change in orders meant a shift from the mobility and aggression of tank warfare to the more static yet equally challenging role of fortifying our lines. His adaptability was a reminder of the versatility and resilience required in the face of ever-changing battle conditions.
Corporal Jenkins, recognising the critical role of communications in our new operational stance, worked tirelessly to ensure our lines remained secure and operational. The expectation of a counter-offensive meant that intelligence and coordination with our infantry counterparts were more crucial than ever. Jenkins's efforts to maintain clear and reliable communication channels were integral to our preparedness. The division as a whole undertook the task of strengthening our defences with a sense of urgency. Minefields were reinforced, anti-tank ditches deepened, and artillery positions fortified. Every action was taken with the knowledge that the enemy's response would be formidable. We were under no illusions about the challenge we faced. The Axis forces were determined, and their counter-offensive would test the mettle of our newly reinforced defences. As the sun set on the last day of July, the Eighth Army found itself in a period of tense anticipation. The quiet that had settled over the front lines was not one of peace, but of preparation. We knew that the coming days would bring new challenges, and that the enemy would come at us with renewed vigour. But we also knew that we were ready, that the trials we had faced had prepared us for what was to come. In the quiet moments before night fully took hold, I looked out over the defences we had built, over the men who had worked tirelessly to prepare for the battle ahead. There was a sense of unity and purpose that bound us together a collective determination to hold our ground, to stand firm against whatever the Axis forces might throw our way. As we settled into the rhythm of reinforcing our positions, it became increasingly clear that General Auchinleck was strategizing several moves ahead. The understanding within our ranks was that Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, the Desert Fox himself, was in a race against time. Rommel was well aware that the longer he waited, the stronger the Allied forces would become, thanks to the increasing flow of supplies and reinforcements reaching us. This urgency compelled him to consider launching an attack before the end of August, a period during which he believed he would still hold a fleeting advantage in armour and mobility. General Auchinleck, with this insight, directed our preparations towards a defensive stance designed not just to withstand an assault, but to turn the tide against the Axis forces when they inevitably struck. The anticipation of Rommel's aggressive tactics informed our every move, leading to a defensive strategy that was as dynamic as it was robust. Orkinleck's plans for a defensive battle were communicated through layers of command with the clear message, we were not merely to survive the expected onslaught, but to emerge in a position of strength. The construction of our defences took on a new urgency with this understanding. Our minefields were not just barriers, but traps our artillery positions not merely points of resistance, but of devastating counterattack. The fortifications we built were designed to channel the enemy into killing zones, where their numerical or material superiority would be mitigated by the cleverness of our layout and the tenacity of our soldiers. Within the division, there was a palpable sense of being part of a larger chess game, each unit a piece with a role to play in the grand strategy devised by Orkinleck. The knowledge that Rommel would have to attack, and attack soon, gave a sharp focus to our efforts. We were not just preparing for a battle. We were setting the stage for a confrontation that would leverage time, terrain, and the growing strength of the Allied forces to our advantage. The division as a whole undertook the task of strengthening our defences with a sense of urgency. Minefields were reinforced, anti-tank ditches deepened, and artillery positions fortified. Every action was taken with the knowledge that the enemy's response would be formidable. We were under no illusions about the challenge we faced. The Axis forces were determined, and their counter-offensive would test the mettle of our newly reinforced defences. As the sun set on the last day of July, the Eighth Army found itself in a period of tense anticipation. The quiet that had settled over the front lines was not one of peace, but of preparation. We knew that the coming days would bring new challenges and that the enemy would come at us with renewed vigour. But we also knew that we were ready, that the trials we had faced had prepared us for what was to come. In the quiet moments before night fully took hold, I looked out over the defences we had built, over the men who had worked tirelessly to prepare for the battle ahead. There was a sense of unity and purpose that bound us together, a collective determination to hold our ground to stand firm against whatever the Axis forces might throw our way. 
As we settled into the rhythm of reinforcing our positions, it became increasingly clear that General Auchinleck was strategizing several moves ahead. The understanding within our ranks was that Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, the Desert Fox himself, was in a race against time. Rommel was well aware that the longer he waited, the stronger the Allied forces would become, thanks to the increasing flow of supplies and reinforcements reaching us. This urgency compelled him to consider launching an attack before the end of August, a period during which he believed he would still hold a fleeting advantage in armour and mobility. General Auchinleck, with this insight, directed our preparations towards a defensive stance designed not just to withstand an assault, but to turn the tide against the Axis forces when they inevitably struck. The anticipation of Rommel's aggressive tactics informed our every move, leading to a defensive strategy that was as dynamic as it was robust. Arkinlek's plans for a defensive battle were communicated through layers of command, with the clear message. We were not merely to survive the expected onslaught, but to emerge in a position of strength. The construction of our defences took on a new urgency with this understanding. Our minefields were not just barriers, but traps. Our artillery positions not merely points of resistance, but of devastating counterattack. The fortifications we built were designed to channel the enemy into killing zones, where their numerical or material superiority would be mitigated by the cleverness of our layout and the tenacity of our soldiers. Within the division, there was a palpable sense of being part of a larger chess game, each unit a piece with a role to play in the grand strategy devised by Auchinleck. The knowledge that Rommel would have to attack, and attack soon, gave a sharp focus to our efforts. We were not just preparing for a battle. We were setting the stage for a confrontation that would leverage time, terrain, and the growing strength of the Allied forces to our advantage. Rommel's inability to launch his counteroffensive, due to these logistical straitjackets, shifted the balance of power in the desert. It underscored the importance of not just the clash of arms, but the vital undercurrents of supply, communication, and intelligence. The realisation that our successes at El Alamein were supported by such hidden victories gave us a renewed appreciation for the unseen efforts of countless individuals behind the scenes. In the lull that followed, our division maintained its vigil, the soldiers' routines marked by the maintenance of equipment, the endless drills, and the ever-present gaze toward the horizon for signs of an attack that would not come. Yet, in the quiet, there was also an acknowledgement of the broader strategic picture, of a war being waged with code and cipher as much as with tank and rifle. For me, and for many of my comrades, this period was a lesson in the multifaceted nature of modern warfare, where battles could be won or lost far from the visible front lines, in the silent exchanges of encrypted messages and the quiet disruption of an enemy's lifelines. It was a reminder that in this vast theatre of conflict, every soldier, every cryptanalyst, every pilot and every sailor played a critical role in the intricate ballet that was the struggle for North Africa. As August waned, we remained on guard, bolstered not just by our fortifications and our guns, but by the knowledge that across the vast network of the Allied war effort, every effort was being made to ensure that when Rommel's forces finally did move, we would be ready to meet them, not just with strength, but with the cunning and insight that had so far kept the enemy at bay. Reports began to filter through the ranks, painting a vivid picture of the conflict that had raged across the desert. The battle, a fierce and protracted engagement, had ended in what could only be described as a stalemate from a tactical, operational and strategic perspective. Yet, within this deadlock, there was a significant victory. The halt of the Axis advance on Alexandria, Cairo and ultimately the Suez Canal. The cost of this standstill was not measured merely in the movement of lines on a map, but in the blood of the men who fought. The Eighth Army, our army, had suffered more than 13,000 casualties in the month of July alone. The New Zealand 2nd Division bore a heavy toll, with 4,000 of its soldiers wounded or lost. The Indian 5th Division and the Australian 9th Division saw 3,000 and 2,552 of their numbers respectively fall in the defence of El Alamein. These numbers, stark and sobering, were a testament to the ferocity of the battle 
and the determination of each soldier who stood against the Axis forces. Yet, amid the losses, there were gains to be counted as well. The Eighth Army had taken 7,000 prisoners and inflicted heavy damage upon the enemy, both in manpower and machinery. Each Axis tank destroyed, each position held against the onslaught, spoke of the resilience and courage of our forces. The cost was high, but the defence of El Alamein had thwarted Rommel's ambitions, providing a much-needed reprieve and the opportunity to regroup and plan for the battles that lay ahead. The aftermath of the First Battle of El Alamein was a time for reflection for all of us. As we heard reports of the casualties and the moments of valour, a deep sense of pride mixed with sorrow filled the air. We mourned the loss of our comrades and felt the weight of their sacrifice, and yet we also drew strength from what had been achieved. The battle had proven that, even against formidable odds, we could hold the line, and that the spirit of the Eighth Army was unbroken. For my crew and me, the reports were a sombre reminder of the reality of war. Sergeant O'Malley, ever the stoic presence, spoke of the need to honour our fallen by continuing the fight with even greater determination. Private Davies, young and fiercely committed, found in the stories of the battle a wellspring of resolve, a determination to stand firm in the face of the enemy. Corporal Jenkins, quietly reflective, recognised the invaluable role of each unit in the mosaic of defence, understanding more deeply the interconnectedness of our efforts. As we prepared for what was to come, the legacy of the first battle of El Alamein lingered in our minds. It was a beacon, a reminder of what could be achieved through unity, bravery and sacrifice. The battle had ended in a stalemate, yes, but it had also marked a turning point, halting the Axis advance and setting the stage for the next phase of the conflict. In the silence of the desert, beneath the vast expanse of the sky, we took a moment to honour those who had given their all in the sands of El Alamein. Their memory would fortify us in the days ahead, a constant reminder of the cost of freedom and the price of victory. Today marks the beginning of a much-needed respite for us all. After the relentless pace of operations and the tension of continuous engagement, the division has been ordered into reserve. This break is not just a pause in the physical sense, but a crucial interval for rest, integration of reinforcements and comprehensive training, which will include night marches to prepare us for future operations. The announcement of our move into reserve was met with a palpable sense of relief and a burst of spontaneous joy among the crew. The prospect of rest, even for a short while, felt like a balm to our weary spirits. For weeks we had been operating under the constant shadow of combat, our lives measured in the distance between engagements and the brief lulls that barely allowed for recovery. Sergeant O'Malley's reaction was emblematic of us all. His usual stoic demeanour gave way to a broad smile as he clapped the men on the back, sharing in the collective sense of reprieve. Lads, we've earned this, he said, his voice carrying a lightness I hadn't heard in weeks. A bit of rest will do us good before we're back at it. Private Davies, ever the heart of our crew, was almost giddy with relief. The laughter and jokes that had become a rarity in recent times returned with a vengeance, as Davies orchestrated a mock parade to celebrate our temporary reprieve from the front lines. His infectious enthusiasm spread quickly, lifting the spirits of everyone around him. Corporal Jenkins, typically reserved, allowed himself a small smile, acknowledging the importance of this interval for reflection and rejuvenation. A well-oiled machine needs maintenance and so do we, he remarked, a nod to the upcoming period of training and integration that would follow our rest. As we began the process of moving into our reserve position, the atmosphere within the division was one of camaraderie and light-hearted exchange. Stories of past battles were shared, not with the somberness of recounting, but with the laughter of survival, a testament to the resilience and indomitable spirit of the men I have the honour to serve with. The exchange between crew members, once dominated by tactical discussions and operational updates, now veered towards plans for leave, the simple pleasures of a hot meal, a proper bed, and the luxury of time spent without the imminent threat of engagement. For many, this break would also be a time to write letters home, a chance to reconnect with loved ones and share the news of our brief respite. 
As night fell on our first day in the reserve, the camp was alive with the sounds of relaxation and recreation. The tension that had been an ever-present companion seemed to dissolve, if only temporarily, under the desert stars. For the first time in what felt like forever, we could afford to look beyond the next engagement, to breathe, to rest, and to prepare ourselves not just physically, but mentally and emotionally for the challenges ahead. This period in reserve is a gift, one we will use to regroup, to integrate the fresh faces who will soon join our ranks, and to hone our skills further through training. But tonight we rest, we laugh, and we remember what it feels like to live without the constant rumble of tanks in the background. The past week has been a whirlwind of activity, as our brief period of rest transitions into a rigorous training schedule. Our focus is on integrating reinforcements into the division and conducting extensive drills that cover a wide range of operational scenarios. However, the emphasis has undeniably been on mastering the art of night marches, an aspect of warfare that the First Battle of El Alamein highlighted as crucial for future engagements. The importance of night manoeuvres was a hard-learned lesson from our recent operations. The ability to move undetected under the cover of darkness, to position forces advantageously before dawn, is a tactical necessity we cannot afford to overlook. Consequently, our training sessions have been designed to simulate the conditions and challenges of nocturnal operations as closely as possible. Lieutenant Graham has been leading the instruction on night navigation, drawing upon his expertise to teach the crews how to read the stars and use them for orientation in the vast, featureless desert. The stars are more reliable than any compass in the desert at night, he often says instilling in us a respect for these ancient methods of navigation that complement our modern equipment. The practice night marches have been both exhilarating and challenging. We move in formation, with all lights extinguished, relying solely on whispered commands and the faint glow of luminescent paint applied to the rear of each vehicle to maintain cohesion. The silence is profound, broken only by the soft rumble of engines and the occasional creak of tank treads on sand. It's a stark contrast to the cacophony of a day battle, offering a different kind of tension, one born of the need for absolute precision and the awareness of how vulnerable we are in the darkness. Sergeant O'Malley's tank crew, alongside mine, has been at the forefront of these exercises, often acting as the lead element in our mock advances. The concentration required to navigate without visual landmarks is immense, but O'Malley's crew has demonstrated an adeptness that has become a benchmark for others. Their success is a testament to the importance of teamwork and communication, qualities that are amplified in the absence of sight. Private Davies, meanwhile, has found a niche in maintaining the silent running of our vehicles. His knack for troubleshooting without the aid of light has ensured that our tanks remain operational and as quiet as possible during these exercises. His efforts, often performed under the pressure of simulated enemy presence, have not gone unnoticed. The night marches have also served as a bonding experience for the division. The shared challenge of moving through the darkness, of relying on one another implicitly, has strengthened the ties between us. It's a different kind of camaraderie that emerges when you navigate by starlight, a mutual trust that goes beyond the spoken word. As we continue with these night exercises, it becomes increasingly clear how vital they are to our success in the coming battles. The first battle of El Alamein taught us many lessons, but none more so than the value of the cover of night. In the darkness, we find not just concealment, but the opportunity to surprise, to manoeuvre, and to strike in ways that the daylight does not permit. Our training will extend into the coming weeks, with each night march adding to our confidence and capability. This period of preparation, though demanding, is shaping us into a more formidable force, one ready to face the challenges that lie ahead with the stealth and precision the night affords. As we continue our rigorous schedule of practice and preparation, a significant shift has occurred within the division that promises to shape our path forward. Major General Raymond Briggs has assumed command bringing with him a fresh perspective and a clear directive to enhance our operational effectiveness. His arrival coincides with a period of reorganisation for the division, 
a strategic alignment with War Office directions issued back in May 1942 that is set to redefine our composition and capabilities. The reorganisation has been a focal point of discussion among the officers and crew alike. The division now comprises the 2nd Armoured Brigade, equipped with a formidable array of armour, one Grant tank, 92 Shermans and 68 Crusaders. This reshuffling of assets ensures that we possess a blend of firepower, mobility and resilience suited to the challenges of desert warfare. The inclusion of the 7th Motor Brigade, consisting of three infantry battalions, further bolsters our combined arms approach, integrating mechanised infantry to support our armoured manoeuvres. The transition under Major General Briggs's leadership has been smooth, marked by a series of briefings and meetings designed to familiarise everyone with the new organisational structure and the strategic vision moving forward. His emphasis on combined arms tactics and the importance of seamless integration between the armoured and motorised elements of the division has resonated strongly with us all. Unity of effort is our greatest weapon, he often remarks, underscoring the synergy that will be crucial to our success on the battlefield. Training sessions have adapted to reflect this reorganisation, with a greater focus on combined operations. Night marches continue to be a staple of our preparation, now complemented by exercises that simulate coordinated attacks involving both tanks and infantry. These drills are challenging, requiring precise communication and coordination, but they are invaluable in honing our ability to operate as a cohesive force. Sergeant O'Malley and his crew have taken to the new challenges with characteristic determination, often leading the way in exercises that test the limits of our new formation's capabilities. Their adaptability has been inspiring, setting a standard for others to follow. Private Davies has been particularly intrigued by the Sherman tanks, their capabilities and role within our revised armoured complement. His enthusiasm for understanding every facet of our equipment has made him a valuable resource, sharing insights and observations that enhance our collective knowledge. Corporal Jenkins, meanwhile, has been instrumental in facilitating the integration of the infantry battalions of the 7th Motor Brigade into our operations. His efforts to establish robust communication lines between the different elements of the division have been crucial in ensuring that our combined arms exercises are as effective as possible. As we adapt to this reorganised structure, there is a sense of renewed purpose within the division. The changes, while significant, have been embraced as an opportunity to enhance our combat effectiveness and to prepare us for the challenges that lie ahead. The presence of Major General Briggs at the helm, guiding us through this period of transition, has been a source of confidence and motivation. The coming weeks will be critical in solidifying the gains from this reorganisation and ensuring that the division is ready to meet the demands of the battlefield. Our continued focus on training, especially the night marches that have become a crucial part of our preparation, will ensure that we remain adaptable, resilient, and ready to take the initiative when the time comes. As we move forward under this new command and structure, the division stands as a testament to the dynamic nature of modern warfare, ready to confront the future with strength, unity, and a shared commitment to victory. In a development that has sent ripples throughout the entire Eighth Army, Lieutenant General Bernard Law Montgomery has assumed command, succeeding General Sir Claude Auchinleck. This change at the very top signifies not just a shift in leadership, but potentially heralds a new approach to our operations in the North African campaign. The news reached us amidst our intensive training regimen and reorganisation efforts injecting a fresh sense of anticipation and curiosity about the future direction under his leadership. Lieutenant General Montgomery, known to some by his nickname Monty, brings with him a reputation for meticulous planning and a no-nonsense approach to military leadership. His arrival has been the subject of much discussion among the officers and men, with many speculating on the changes he might introduce to the strategy and tactics of the 8th Army. For us in the 1st Armoured Division, the change in command at the army level underscores the fluid nature of military leadership and strategy. It comes at a time when we are undergoing our own transformations, adapting to new structures and preparing for whatever challenges lie ahead. The coincidence of these changes has not gone unnoticed, 
emphasizing the interconnectedness of leadership, strategy, and operational effectiveness. Montgomery's first addresses to the troops have been keenly observed. He emphasizes discipline, training, and the need for a victory against the Axis forces. His determination to turn the tide in North Africa is palpable, resonating with our own resolve to make a decisive impact. We ourselves will start to plan a great offensive. It will be the beginning of a campaign which will hit Rommel and his army for six right out of Africa, he reportedly declared, a statement reflecting both his confidence and his intent to pursue aggressive action. The atmosphere within the division has shifted slightly with Montgomery's appointment. There's a renewed focus on the efficiency of operations and the importance of each unit's role within the larger strategy of the Eighth Army. This has led to a more rigorous analysis of our training exercises, with an eye towards improving operational coordination and effectiveness in a way that aligns with the new commander's expectations. Sergeant O'Malley remarked, It's as if we're gearing up for something big, something that could change the course of the war here. His words capture the sentiment that pervades the division, a mix of anticipation and readiness to adapt to Montgomery's strategic vision. Private Davies has been poring over every piece of information he can find on Montgomery, trying to glean insights into how the general's past victories might influence his plans for the North African campaign. Understanding the boss's way of thinking might just give us the edge we need, he mused, reflecting the proactive stance many have taken in response to the change. Corporal Jenkins, on the other hand, has focused on the practical implications of Montgomery's command. It's all about readiness now, he noted, emphasising the importance of being prepared for rapid adjustments to tactics and operations. As we continue our preparations, the impact of Montgomery's leadership is already being felt. There's a sense that we are at the cusp of a significant phase in the campaign, one that might very well define the future of North Africa and beyond. The 1st Armoured Division, reorganised and re-energised, stands ready to play its part under the new command structure of the 8th Army. The challenges ahead are daunting, but with Lieutenant General Montgomery at the helm, there's a growing belief in our ability to meet them head on. The days ahead will undoubtedly test our resolve, our skills and our unity, but we remain committed to the cause, ready to contribute to the success of the Eighth Army under its new leader. Recent reports have reached us regarding the aftermath of the Battle of Alam Halfa, highlighting a significant shift in the Axis forces' strategy and condition in North Africa. The battle, which lasted from the 30th of August to the 4th of September 1942, has evidently taken a heavy toll on Field Marshal Erwin Rommel and his Panzerarmee Africa, recently redesignated as the Deutsch Italienische Panzerarmee. The setback faced by the Axis forces under Rommel's command has been a subject of much discussion within our ranks, offering a glimmer of strategic opportunity for the Allied forces. The exhaustive nature of the battle for Rommel's forces is of particular note. It is reported that the engagement severely drained the axis of men, vehicles, tanks, and, crucially, nearly all their available fuel supply. This depletion of essential resources has forced Rommel to order his forces to transition from their previously offensive posture to preparing defensive positions across a strategic stretch of land from El Alamein on the Mediterranean coast to Karet El Himeymat on the northern edge of the vast Katara Depression. The Axis defensive strategy is marked by the construction of overlapping minefields, a traditional but effective means of halting advancing forces. These minefields are reportedly covered by artillery placements, creating a formidable barrier to any direct assault. Beyond these initial defences, the Axis infantry formations are positioned, providing a secondary layer of resistance. Behind the infantry, what remains of the Axis armour is held in reserve, likely to counter any breach in the front-line defences. This defensive arrangement signals a significant shift in the Axis operational doctrine in North Africa. The reliance on static defences suggests a recognition of their weakened state and a possible limitation in their ability to conduct large-scale offensive operations in the near term. For us in the 1st Armoured Division, this presents both a challenge and an opportunity. The challenge lies in overcoming a well-prepared defensive line, 
a task that will require careful planning, coordination, and the integration of all available intelligence and resources. The opportunity, however, is in exploiting the Axis Force's apparent resource depletion and morale. Our intelligence officers have been working diligently to gather information on the locations and strengths of the minefields, artillery placements, and the disposition of Axis infantry and armour. This information is crucial for planning our approach to breaching the Axis defences and for preparing countermeasures to their artillery and armoured reserves. Discussions among the division's officers have centred on the tactical implications of the Axis defensive preparations. Lieutenant Colonel Phillips remarked, Their heavy reliance on minefields and static defences could be their undoing. With the right approach, we can turn their strategy against them. This sentiment is shared by many within the division, who see the Axis's current posture as indicative of their strategic vulnerability. Our engineers have been tasked with developing methods to breach the minefields safely, while our reconnaissance units have increased their patrols to gather more detailed information on the Axis defensive positions. The importance of intelligence and preparation has never been more apparent, with every piece of information potentially contributing to a successful breakthrough. As we continue our preparations and training, the situation on the front lines serves as a constant reminder of the complexities of desert warfare. The Axis forces, despite their setbacks, remain a formidable opponent, and their defensive preparations warrant a cautious but determined approach. Our division, under the new leadership of Lieutenant General Montgomery, is gearing up for what may become a pivotal moment in the North African campaign. The mood within the division is one of cautious optimism. The knowledge of Rommel's setbacks and the visible shift in his strategy have bolstered our confidence. However, we remain acutely aware of the challenges that lie ahead. The battle for North Africa is far from over, and the road to victory will undoubtedly be fraught with difficulties. Yet, with careful planning, relentless training and unwavering determination, we move forward, ready to face whatever challenges the Axis forces have prepared for us. As the British and Commonwealth forces continue their preparations for the next phase of the North African campaign, there is a palpable sense of anticipation and readiness within our ranks. Lieutenant General Bernard Law Montgomery and his senior commanders are acutely aware that the decisive moment in our struggle against the Axis forces is upon us. This recognition is not just a matter of strategic positioning, but a reflection of the significant improvements in our forces' composition, training and equipment. For the first time since the campaign's onset, we find ourselves in a position of strength that extends beyond mere numbers. The quality of our men, hardened by the trials of desert warfare and buoyed by recent successes, has never been higher. More importantly, we are now equipped with material that allows us to meet the Axis forces on equal terms, most notably the introduction of the USM-4 Sherman medium tank into our armoured brigades. The Sherman represents a significant leap forward in our armoured capabilities. Its design, featuring the main turret on the top, offers a strategic advantage in battlefield visibility and firing range. This design change is not merely cosmetic, but represents a fundamental shift in the tank's operational effectiveness, especially when compared to the preceding M3 Grant, whose main gun was mounted in a limited traverse sponson. The turret-mounted 75mm main gun of the Sherman offers qualitative parity with the German PCK PFW-4 battle tank. This parity is not just about matching the enemy's firepower, but surpassing it in critical aspects, particularly in the anti-tank role. The Sherman's main gun, with its superior calibre and mounting, allows for more versatile engagement strategies, enabling our forces to engage Axis armour with increased confidence and effectiveness. The significance of this advancement cannot be overstated. For months we have sought an answer to the Axis's armoured superiority, and with the Sherman, we finally have a weapon capable of tilting the balance in our favour. The crews of our division have been quick to adapt to these new tanks, with training sessions focused on maximising their potential on the battlefield. Sergeant O'Malley, who has had extensive experience with a variety of armoured vehicles, remarked on the Sherman's capabilities with a note of approval. This is the tank we've been waiting for, 
he observed after a training session. It's going to change the way we fight. Private Davies, always eager to master new equipment, has thrown himself into learning everything he can about the Sherman. His enthusiasm is shared by his fellow crew members, who see the tank as a symbol of our evolving strength and a key to future victories. Corporal Jenkins, meanwhile, has been focused on integrating the capabilities of the Sherman into our combined arms tactics. The improved communication systems and the tank's operational flexibility offer new possibilities for coordination with infantry and artillery, enhancing our overall combat effectiveness. As we prepare for the coming battle, the arrival of the Sherman tanks has injected a new sense of optimism into our division. The knowledge that we now possess men of the highest quality, equipped with the right material, has fortified our resolve. Montgomery and his commanders have set the stage for a decisive confrontation, and we stand ready to seize the moment.